Uh, we're in this crazy series called Some Assembly Required, kind of a graphic, uh, kind of a bold uh, graphic design that Jason came up with to kind of talk about what we want to talk about, and it's simply this, is that I think some people are falling apart because of the pressures of life, and some marriages are falling apart, some relationships are falling apart. I said it last week, so please, if you're, not, if you're new here today, listen to last week, you can listen on the app. This is not just a series for married people. You can take these principles and use them with your teenage son, with a co-worker. It's about relationships. Life is about relationships. I don't know if you know this or not, but that's all that really matters. It's relationships, people. Amen. Uh, I don't know that I've ever done this before, but last week I didn't finish my sermon. I I can't ever remember doing that, but uh, last week we did not finish. So today is actually the sum of our parts Part two, that's the title of today's message. I was going to give it a different title, but how could I? It's the same as last week's, it's just part two. The sum of our parts. If you're a younger person, that sentence may not make sense, but if you Google it, what you'll find is that uh, there's a whole school of philosophy behind the fact that we are greater. The sum of our parts is greater than who we are individually. Together, we are better than we would ever be alone. We need each other. Turn to your spouse, turn to your friend and say, I need you. Just tell somebody. I don't like preachers to tell you what to say, but it'll feel, it'll feel good. Tell somebody, say, I need you. And then say, to buy lunch today. That's a good, <laughs> you can add whatever you want on the end, but just tell somebody you need them. I need you to pay my mortgage. I'm in trouble. <laughs> I need you. Uh, I'm the recap king, so it's in your notes already, but look, last week what we said, it was the premise of our whole teaching was this, everything in our culture today is about division, about dividing, everything in our culture today. We see that in politics, we see, but it's invaded the church. Everything is about dividing today, about what side are you on. And I believe that Lucifer's behind this, the devil's behind this. Why? Because he knows in Scripture uh, that in Mark's Gospel it says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And he knows that the way to destroy the church, the way to destroy a nation, and the way to destroy a marriage is to divide people. If I can just get in between you, if I can just get a wedge in there, I I can cause a problem. And uh, we see this in the family, we see it in relationships. And uh, we are not unaware of his tactics. Amen? And so we preached pretty hard last week that men and women were created to be intimate allies, never to be enemies. We should not fight amongst the sexes. We should figure out how to get along. Amen? Uh, And and so we talked last week about God's plan for marriage, that God actually has a plan for marriage. And what we learned is, is that his plan is that we are to be united, united physically, united emotionally, and united spiritually. Those are the three ways. It's already filled in in your notes. And then we gave you our little triangle of love, uh, which I've used for years in, uh, in counseling. And, and it's got that little triangle that's in your notes. I don't, there it is right there. Look, uh, if you put your wife's name over there and, and the husband's name over there and God is on the top, and both of you are saying, listen, we want to connect with each other spiritually, emotionally, and physically, and we want that connection between us, but our individual goal is to press towards God. I want to be more like Jesus. I, I'm not going to worry about my wife. I'm not Her spiritual uh, relationship with God, although I can augment that and help her in that, uh, that's her, she has to drive that. I, you, you know that you can't change your husband. <laughs> Uh, that one single lady, she gets me every week. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, you can't, you can't, listen, you'll never nag your husband into being a better man. You won't, you won't nag him into being a better man. The more you nag him, the more you'll push him away from that. I told you last week, stop telling him, take out the trash, take out the trash, take out the trash. Because you're not saying it like that. You're saying, could you help me please? The kids have been, can you take out the trash? But all a man hears is, can you take out the trash? What you got to do is wait till he takes out the trash. I told you last week, go get your go-go boots, your pom-poms, stand in the driveway. You the man, you the man, you the man. He, He will take out, amen, yeah. He will take out that trash. The the trash can't be empty. He'd be carrying it out. (laughs) Just get, you got to learn how to motivate. We learned last week, what, every man on the planet wants what? He wants to be respected and honored. Every female on the planet wants to feel safe and secure. 
If you can make your spouse feel safe and secure, gentlemen, I'm telling you what, you're headed in the right direction. That means when you go out without her and buy a boat and you don't tell her and now you're struggling to pay the mortgage this month, it means she struggles to what? Honor you and respect you. Why? Because she can't trust you. Okay. Uh, and the goofy thing about this triangle, look, look how simple this is, is the more I decide I want to connect with my wife physically, spiritually, and emotionally, but I want to draw closer to God. And if my wife has that same compassion and that same desire, look what happens to us. We're drawing closer and closer to each other by total accidents, by osmosis. Next month, I will be married 39 years. Yeah. Don't, 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 don't clap. Don't, don't. I'm, I'm not really worthy of it. 39 years. And I'm talking to the same woman. <laughs> I met somebody the other day. They said to me, I've been married 30 years. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Isn't that your third wife? And he was like, yeah, but if you add it all up, it's 30 years. I'm like, no, that, you can't, that doesn't count. You can't do that. Um... I'm taking too long. We'll never get out of here on time. Uh, I want you to get to Denny's before the Grand Slam breakfast is over. Uh, we learned last week that God has a plan for marriage. I told you if he came back this week, I would show you God's purpose for marriage. That's what I want to talk to you about today, God's purpose for marriage. I was blessed this morning, a young girl in church who happens to be a good friend of mine. Um, I believe she's 10, I think, 10 how old's Riley? Is she 10 or 9? Brannion, where is she? Is she here in church? How old are you? She's 10. Can you stand up for me, sweetheart? Can you stand up on the chair? Stand up on the chair so everybody sees her. Look at this little sweetheart. Isn't, isn't she something? Isn't she just the best? She's the best. All right, sit down, honey. That's all you're getting. She'll give me a hard time afterwards. She's a pip. You talk to her. She's fabulous. I just absolutely love her. A lot of great kids in the church. I don't love her more than I love your kids, so don't say me. He never asked my kid to stand up on the chair. Um, uh, my young friend was, I didn't, Pastor Andy came and told me she was on the way into church this morning, and Pastor Andy said to her, are you coming to Kids Zone? And she said, ah, I really want to go to Kids Zone, but I, I really, uh, Pastor Mark is doing part two this week. And I don't want to miss part two. And then she paused and she said, but are there going to be any like yucky parts? Is he going to talk about anything like married people, yucky stuff? So we'll try to keep it PG uh, 13 for you this morning. But I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the purpose of marriage. Uh, purpose is a cool word. You should look it up. But the simple definition of the word purpose is the reason for which something exists or is done. What, what is the purpose of that? You understand that when you have something in your hand, if you don't know the purpose of it, it's pretty useless. If I gave you a, a tool and you didn't know what that tool was for, which for me would basically be almost any tool you could give me. <laughs> uh, my dad's got all kinds of tools, and my brother Jason, and sometimes that, I've seen him with tools, and I'm like, that looks really cool and it's awesome. That would make a great paperweight on your desk. Uh, and then they explain what it does and you're like, oh, that's really cool. It does that. Uh, sometimes we lose out on a lot of things in life because we don't understand the purpose for it. Today, I want to try and drag us back as a church. And my responsibility is only this church, but I want to try and drag us back to understand what the purpose of marriage is. And when you understand the purpose of marriage... I believe you'll begin to understand the sanctity of it, the holiness of it, and the importance of it in our culture. Because marriage has kind of been treated kind of like it doesn't really matter. And I'm not again, I'm not talking out there in the world, in the church. Do you know that young couples living together before they're married is as big an issue in the church today as it is in the world? And we have couples who live with each other and, and act as married couples and come to church every Sunday and say they love God and say they love the Lord and, and they're living together in in a look how quiet it is in here. It's called fornication. It's, it, it's a sin. Oh, pastor, don't say that. You're going to lose some people. <laughs> Not really. Tell people the truth. The truth heals. It hurts, but it heals. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the reason that's happened in the church, and, and if you talk to some millennials, they'll tell you that, well, marriage doesn't have to be between a man and a woman. 
and, and we should be more open-minded, and, and maybe marriage should have a broader interpretation. The reason for that, I believe, is because there are many young people that don't understand God's purpose in marriage. When you understand the purpose, then you begin to understand, oh, that's why that is so sacred. That's why that is so important. So that's our prayer today. Would you, would you pray with us? Father, as we open your word, would you just touch our minds? God, we don't want to be entertained today. We want to be transformed. Uh, we, we don't necessarily even need more information. We, we know the truth of your word. God, would you help us to receive it, to apply it, and to live by it? And I pray, God, today that you would uh, hide your servant behind the truth of the cross and your word and that you would help people be receptive today to what your word says. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I am not going to reread the portion of scripture that we read last week. We read a lengthy portion of scripture. It's in your bulletin. It says it there. Read Genesis chapter 2, 18 through 25. I'll, meant, I'll reference it. I'll talk about it. If you're watching online, I don't want you to think, man, that guy preached. He never read the word. We read a whole chunk of Genesis last week. I'm not going to reread it today. It's the story of the creation of Eve uh, from the side of Adam, from his rib. And, and we talked about that at great length last week. So we understand God's plan for marriage. Um, the purpose of God's marriage, I'm going to give it to you in one sentence. And I know some of you will fill this in and say, well, can we go home? No, I want to talk to you about it just for 10 minutes this morning. Watch this. God's design for marriage. God designed marriage to meet our needs for companionship and to provide a picture of our relationship with Christ. This is what marriage is for. Oh, uh, uh, marriage is to just make babies. Well, that's a part of the process. That's the part of the sexual component to it. But the purpose of marriage is, is, is not to have babies. Uh, the purpose of marriage, I'll show you from Scripture, is that God designed it. His purpose was to meet our need for companionship and also to provide a picture of our relationship with him. That second part is what we'll talk about as we close out today. I just want to cover quickly this issue of companionship. I told you last week, if you read with us in Genesis, uh, it's correct. The Hebrew actually says, when Adam sees Eve, he says, now, finally, Adam was waiting he had named all of the creatures on the planet, remember? He had named everything. We don't know how long he'd been alone, but for every elephant, there was a girl elephant. For every giraffe boy, there was a girl giraffe. And it kind of suddenly begins to dawn on him. And God says, it's not good that man should be alone. Uh, and, and so now he lets Adam name all the animals so that in Adam's heart, there is stirring this hunger for, I want somebody to love. I want somebody to be with. I, I'm the only human here. Everybody's got somebody, but I don't have anybody. And so when, when he wakes up and God presents Eve to him, he says, wow, finally, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. He, he's excited by the person that God brings into his life. And can I just tell you something? I don't care if you're as old as I am and next week, like I told you, in a couple weeks is my 39th wedding anniversary. You should get up every once in a while. You should look across the room at your spouse and you should say, wow, look what God has blessed me with. And, and men, I don't just mean in those wow moments. I mean when she's making dinner, when, when she's bringing up your children, when you see her around the house, you should say, wow. I'm so glad I'm not alone in life. I don't like when my wife, it, it doesn't happen a lot in our marriage, but every once in a while my wife will have to go away just overnight. She went on a ladies' trip a little while ago, and she was gone like two nights. I, I was like a basket case. Uh, for two days I was walking around like I didn't know what to wear, I didn't know what to eat, I didn't know where to go. I, I didn't know anything. That was bad enough, but I couldn't believe how lonely I was. I was like, I, I, I just can't imagine. And then, you know, I'm, I'm that type of person, so I started thinking about, you know, what if she was dead? What if she passed away? And what would my life be like? And I thought, you know, would I remarry somebody? I thought, well, there'd be a lot of women that want me, but no, I don't. <laughs> and I'm not going to do that. And I, my brain starts to go like that. And when my wife came home, I hugged her and I, I kissed her and I had a present for her. She was like, I only went away overnight. I said, don't ever go again. <laughs> I missed you. Don't, don't wait for your wife to go away. Tell your spouse, today, sometime today, tell your spouse, say, man, I'm so glad you're my friend. I'm so glad you're my companion. I, I, I'd, I'd rather be with you than anybody. I told you last week, I'd rather be with my wife than anybody. 
I'd rather go someplace with her than anybody else. She's my best friend. Marriage is to be a relationship of companionship, completion, and communion. The God-designed difference between male and female are to be accepted as complementary, not competitive. I told you last week, God created us equally. The Hebrew word for female is isha. The Hebrew word for male is ish. Ish, my husband, ish. Uh, it's the same word. It's just a male noun and the female noun. We are the same in God's eyes. Uh, a young man came to me after church and he said, Pastor, if we're the same, then you know how come God says you know the, the woman is subject to the husband? And I'm not here to teach on that today, but you have to understand that just because God made us different with different roles doesn't mean that he doesn't love us the same and that we're not equal in God's eyes. We just have different roles. <laughs> Denim is stronger than silk, but silk is beautiful. Some men are like, what's silk? <laughs> what is silk? I don't even know what silk is. You put that in your coffee? What is that? You put that in your... <laughs> it's a relationship of companionship, completion, and communion. God designed marriage. He created it. His purpose is behind it all. This means that he knows best how it should operate. You know, if you wanted to talk about a, a machine, you'd want to talk to the guy that invented it, the guy that designed it. Why? Because he knows more about it than anybody else. You'd be foolish not to read the operator's manual that he wrote, he created. He's the engineer that designed it, so he wrote the manual. He knows more about it than anybody else. You'd be foolish to say, well, this guy designed this, but I want to talk to this other person over here about it. Why would we go to anybody but God? Uh, 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 his word gives us the principles that we need for a complete and satisfying marriage. Since God designed marriage, I believe it takes three to actually make a great marriage. You can, you can have good marriages, but a great marriage. You, you need God, you need the man, and you need the woman. You need the three elements. When you put those three elements together, we begin to see God's design. So, uh, God designed us to meet our need for companionship. Let me show you how companionship works and then I'll get to my message. Watch quickly. Listen, companionship requires the following things. This is what companionship requires. Companionship requires that marriage be a primary relationship. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. It, it, it's a, it, it, if there's going to be companionship in your relationship, you need to understand that it must become your primary, primary school. First, most important, the foundational relationship in your life. I, I, I told you, I want to be with my wife more than anybody else. That, that's the foundation of who I am. This is a primary relationship. God did not create a father and a mother for Adam. God didn't create a child for Adam, nor another man for Adam, but a wife. A man must leave his father and mother in order to cleave to his wife, to establish a one flesh relationship. This means that the marriage relationship is primary, not the child-parent relationship. I'm just telling you what I deal with as a pastor in, in a church of this size. You would be amazed at how many people get married today and one or both of the spouse are still connected by the umbilical cord to their parents. There's nothing wrong with, with taking care of your kids, and I think you should provide for your children, and, and you ought to, you know, uh, nothing wrong with feeding your baby, nothing wrong with taking care of you, nothing wrong with changing diapers. But, but if you have to part whiskers to get the baby bottle in, it's time to let go. I'm just telling you, all right? It's time to let go. You got to let them go. The Bible says that our children are arrows in the quiver of a man and a woman. They're arrows. Do you understand that? Children are to be raised, yes, to be straight, to have a purpose, to have a direction. But the goal in raising children is, is that I can let them go. I got to let them go. I got to let them go figure it out. Uh, listen, some of you young married couples, you're going to have fights. You're going to have issues. Let me give you one of the best pieces of advice you've ever heard in all your life. Don't go back home. And if you're a parent, don't let them in. 
I just, just tonight, mom, can I come back home? No, you got married. Now, I know someone's going to send me an email. If your daughter calls you up and her husband has been physically abusive to her, don't let her in. Call 911. Have that jerk arrested. And then call me. We'll go over there and beat the fire out of him. <laughs> we'll, we'll give him a Jesus lesson. I, I understand there are extra... I, I, I'm talking about just the normal stuff of life. Can I tell you how many times as a pastor, I, I got to tell in-laws and outlaws, butt out. Yeah, but I'm going to fix... No, you're not. Shut up. It must become a primary relationship for companionship to work. Now, that doesn't mean we don't need counsel. It doesn't mean we don't need help. But, but that couple has to seek that out. And they have to humble themselves and go get that help. If you're continually clashing and fighting, you should get some outside help. But don't make it your in-laws or your parents. Don't you come home. I, I don't, my son has never come home and, and complained to me about my daughter-in-law. Not once. Ever, ever, ever. And I know she's got issues. I know it. Oh, we live next door to each other. She got issues, I'm telling you right now. But he has never, my son has never come to me and said, Dad, can you help? I'm struggling with it. I don't know how to deal with it. Because he knows this. I would tell him, go get some help. I'm not the guy to help you. We cut the umbilical cord a long time ago. Uh, listen, can I just say this too to couples that have children? Listen, it also means that if a couple builds their marriage around their children, or as more frequently happens in marriages, the husband will build his life around his career and the wife will build it around their children. And then your children grow up and go off to college. You have a problem in that marriage. There's a lot of people married 30 years and all of a sudden they're getting divorced. Why? Because their kids are all gone. And they suddenly realize, I don't even know you. She's been dealing with the kids. He's been working. They haven't been friends. Marriage needs to be your primary. Sir, your wife's more important than your kids. I don't know if you've ever heard that in church before, but you and your wife. When we were kids growing up, we always knew we were in trouble. My dad's a tough disciplinarian, and there were certain things we could do and get away with, and my dad was always merciful, and he was gracious and all those kind of things, but every once in a while, we would sass our mom, more Jason than me, but uh, <laughs> Jason would sass my mom, and there was a phrase my dad would use. We picked up on it early as kids. Every once in a while, we'd go, my dad would say, hey, hey, don't talk to your mother like that, you know, uh, and, and I would say, you know, well, she said, who is she, my father said. He says, she is a mother cat. Who's she? Well, mom, then call her your mother. She's not she. Yes, sir. Okay, no problem, Dad. <laughs> and my, my, hey, I told you, don't sash your mom. I'll clip you around the ear. You, be, you know. And then we keep going, we keep going. And all of a sudden, my dad would stand up and say, hey, you're talking to my wife. Ooh, Jesus, you knew we were in trouble. The wrath of the Lord was coming. There was no pulling that back. There was no, have mercy on me in Jesus. It was too late. Too late. You sassed my wife. My dad would grab, my dad would clip you around here and say, if you were a grown man, I'd punch you in the mouth. Don't you talk to my wife like that. I wouldn't let some guy in the street talk to my wife like that, and I'm not going to let you talk to my wife like that. I know some of you say, your father hit you? Yes. <laughs> Why do you think I'm so scarred and damaged? <laughs> I told my dad once, he hit me once. I said, you hit me again, I'm calling DCF. What is it, DCFD? I get nervous when you know what that acronym is, but uh, I told him once I'm calling DCF, and I picked the phone up. Remember the phone? Remember the phone? Shh, shh. I picked the phone up. I said, I'm calling DCF. My dad said, when you hang up with them, call 911. <laughs> <LAUGHTER> I, w I was like, uh, click. companionship requires that marriage be the primary. This is the most important relationship. And, and, and dads, moms, let me tell you something. The healthiest thing you could ever do for your children is to make that your primary relationship. You think your kids are going to suffer because you put her first. They won't. Your daughter will grow up understanding that's the kind of man I want to marry, not a man that puts me second, a man who puts me first. Remember this, that every child in your home right now, you are training to either be a husband or a wife of somebody. Get it right. It's a primary relationship. Uh, secondly, companionship requires that marriage be a permanent relationship. I, I know these are fundamental truths, but uh, again, my apologies to those who have been saved a long, long time. You know these things, but there's so many new believers in our church that these fundamental truths, uh, again, like I said, we've, we've just drifted away from them. 
Uh, what God has joined together, let no one separate. That's Jesus. Can't get any higher authority than that in the book of Matthew. Companionship requires that marriage be a permanent relationship. This follows on after it being a primary. So it's a primary relationship and it's a permanent relationship. Uh, it, it says, uh, be joined, uh, what God hath joined together. That, the, he, the, Greek, the, the Greek word there in the New Testament, joined, it literally means like when you take two pieces of wood and you, you cut the different shapes and you're a joiner and you put glue in there. It means you're glued. It means you're glued. Are you with me? Uh, what, what God has joined, what God has glued together. So uh, here's the truth. I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but if you're married, you're stuck. <laughs> You're stuck. This is it. This is the one. But see, we, we tell young people today, you know, you got to look for the one, the one, the right one, Mr. Right. There is no Mr. Right. There isn't. There's no such thing as a Mr. Right. There are no Mr. Rights. We're men. We're never right. Sometimes we get, we get it right by accident, and we're shocked. <laughs> we don't tell anybody. We're like, oh, I did a good job there. <laughs> No one's more shocked than us. Hey, like, uh, our kids ask us a question and we get it right and our wife says, good job. We go, yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow, ask him, what'd you say? He's like, I don't know. I don't know what I did. I don't know. But I got an attaboy, so I'm happy. She got the pom-poms out. I'm thrilled. I, I don't... <laughs> it's a permanent relationship and it's a personal relationship because it is our primary relationship. Uh, Jesus actually quotes from the book of Genesis. Can, can I just read it for you real quick? Watch this. In Matthew chapter 19, it says this. The Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? He replied, have you never read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined inseparably to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This means that the marriage relationship must be built primarily on covenant commitment. Old-fashioned words. <laughs> Not on feelings of romantic love. Romantic love is important, but the foundation of marriage is a commitment of the will. Commitment is what holds a couple together through the difficulties that invariably will come. I'm a big romance guy. I'm a big... Valentine's Day guy, I, I'm a big give your wife a gift guy, I, I'm a big show your love, but can I tell you something, your marriage will not stand on romance, romance comes and goes, there are going to be days when you don't feel like being romantic, talking to the older people here, young people like, well, I always feel romantic, <laughs> wait, you get a little, you don't feel romantic, nah, I'm good. Does that mean you don't love me? No. It's got, uh, does it mean you're going to leave me? going to go somewhere else? No. I'm in a covenant. See, there's a big difference between a marriage contract and a marriage covenant. I, I like wedding rings. Uh, I'll never get finished here, but listen, I, I like wedding rings. I like them for a bunch of reasons, but the main reason I like them is because of what they really mean. A lot of people don't know what they really mean. Um, uh, what this says to everyone else is when I have this ring on, my wife has a beautiful wedding ring, and I, I love when she wears it because for all the years we've been married, any time a man has ever looked at her and thought, wow, there's a beautiful woman, there's an attractive woman, he looks at her hand and says, oh, too late. It's already taken. It's good. Wear your wedding ring. There's an old Charlie Pride song. Does my ring hurt your finger when you go out at night? When I gave it to you, darling, it seemed to fit just right. But now when you go out at night, you leave it on the dresser. It, it's a signal. Wear it. Uh, I wear one, not for the same reason. It's not like a lot of women are looking. Well, there are a lot of women looking at me. But <laughs> this tells people that I, I, I'm married. I belong to somebody. But what a lot of people don't know is this, is that this, this idea of a wedding band comes from thousands of years ago when two families, two tribes would come together to seal that arrangement. They would make an arrangement. Your goats are going to feed with our goats. Our camels are going to water in your wells. We're going to come together as two great tribes. We're going to become one. The patriarchs of that tribe would often take a son and a daughter. And I, I know you don't like it, and I don't like it either, but that's the culture back then. And they would do an arranged marriage. That marriage would be a symbol of what? Of the covenant that they were entering into. They would sign a legal document of the covenant. Our tribes will now be one. The marriage was a symbol of that covenant. 
and the two patriarchs, not the bride and groom, the two men, Abraham and somebody else, uh, Ishmael and somebody else, they would sign a covenant and they would sign the bottom in blood. It would be a piece of parchment. They would roll it up, put it in an earthen vessel and bury it on the land so that if anybody ever asked, they had proof. We're in covenant. The two men who signed it would cut themselves on this finger and draw a little blood and sign it. So when you went through life, if you saw a man with a scar on this finger, it meant that man is in covenant with another tribe, with another people. So every time you look at your wedding band, sir, every time you put that back on in the morning or, or put it on before you leave the house, or you look at it. Ladies, when you look at that giant rock that he bought you, <laughs> When, when you look at that ring that he bought you, you need to tell yourself, it's not about the diamond. It's not about the beauty of it. What it means is this, is this man is in covenant with me. He's not going anywhere. This is not a contract. See, here's, here's the difference. A contract is about me protecting my rights. A contract is about what am I going to get out of this and what happens if I don't like it and how do I get out? Talk to a lawyer. That's what a contract is. It protects your rights. A covenant is about... What am I bringing to this? And there is no way out. I'm in this permanently. Companionship requires it to be a permanent relationship. Listen, we don't break up, we don't move out, we work it out. I love that. We don't break up, we don't move out, we work it out. I know it's corny, and I've said it 8 million times from this pulpit, but I've told my wife for almost 39 years, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. You're stuck with me. We are, we are one. Companionship requires that marriage be a permanent relationship. Thirdly, i, I got to let you out of here. Listen, companionship requires that marriage be an exclusive relationship and shall be joined to his wife. The text says to his wife, not wives. I know some of you get confused when you read the Old Testament, but monogamy is God's design. One man, one woman. You say, but wait, Pastor, in the Old Testament, there's, there's some polygamy. You see guys with more than one wife. Yes, God permitted it. God, God allowed it. And, and it doesn't mean God was happy with it. And I, there's not a case of polygamy in the Bible you can read that there isn't trouble. Solomon, the wisest man on the face of the earth, he's given the gift of wisdom by God. It says in his old age, he was led astray by silly women, by wives. He had hundreds and hundreds of wives and concubines. Some say 300, some say 700. I don't know how you keep track of it all. Never mind the credit card bills and the, and the, and the <laughs> whose charge card was that? I, this means that when you get married, listen to me, listen to me, young people, listen to me. When you get married, it means you give up close friendships with women other than your wife or with men other than your husband. You give up your freedom to go out with the guys whenever you choose. You have a new relationship with your wife. She is now your first priority in terms of human relationships. Now listen to me, men especially. If you can't handle that, you're not mature enough to get married. I can't tell you how many young couples I deal with. You know, I just need a night out with the girls. I just need a night out with the girls. And I'm like, dude, you're a man. Stop <laughs> talking like that. Stop it. I'm going to have to slap you. I'm just... I'm joking with you, but you know what I'm talking about. I, I talk to young guys. They're married. They're, they're married two years. Their wife says, you know, he keeps going out with all his buddies. You, you walked away from that. You made a commitment to this one. Companionship requires that marriage be an exclusive relationship. And there's nothing wrong with going with your buddies once. I, I, I understand that, but grow up. Companionship requires that marriage be an intimate relationship. Sorry, Riley. And they shall become one flesh. This one flesh obviously emphasizes the sexual union between a couple. And I don't know how to say it other than just say it. Can I tell you that one of the biggest problems I deal with in married couples who come to see me is that there's sexual tension between them. And by that, I don't mean that they're having a lot of sex. I mean they're having hardly any sex. And that it's a problem in their relationship. And that's true of young married couples and older married couples. Listen, sexual union is always more, however, than just physical. It must be built on relational and emotional oneness. Most sexual problems in marriage stem from a failure of relational intimacy. It goes back to that respect and it goes back to that trust issue, in other words. 
It's, it's, I understand from a woman's perspective, it's hard to give yourself to a man that you don't trust. You don't feel secure giving yourself to him. So you need help. You've got to work on these things. But the problem usually is not the sexual component. It's what's behind it. It's what's going on in the background. Uh, uh, sexual harmony must be built on the foundation of a primary, permanent, exclusive relationship that is growing in trust, communication, and oneness. This is how God made us say amen. The Bible says that God created marriage for a purpose bigger than itself. I want to close today by just teaching you this in five simple minutes. Watch this. Marriage is a picture of the believer's relationship with God. Marriage has two purposes. One, that we have companionship. And we've lost this in the church. We're, we're not best friends with our spouse anymore. And we need to get back to those things. This is about companionship. Uh, but it's deeper than that. It's more than that. Yes, God met Adam's need for companionship. Rightly so. He said it's not good that man should be alone. But the Bible says that God created marriage for a purpose bigger than itself. Marriage is a picture of the believer's relationship with God. So I want to read a portion of scripture and I want to give you two slides and I'll let you go home because you've got to go work this out. All I can do is show it to you. I can't live this for you. Listen, here's what the Bible says in the New Testament. It's Ephesians chapter 5. It says, wives, be subject. Submit to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. Ladies, the scripture encourages you to submit. That, that doesn't mean he's the boss. It doesn't mean he should boss you around. We'll read a little moment just about what it means. But it, but it means that wives should do this as a service unto who? As unto the Lord. I know what my role is in this relationship. I know what my role is as the wife. And I want to be that Proverbs woman. And so I, I submit to my husband. Mm, someone said it, and it's worth repeating. I, I wish I could actually insert it right into your notes this morning. No woman ever wants to be in submission to a man who is not in submission to Christ. Therein lies the problem. No woman wants to be in submission to a man who is not in submission to Christ. But if you'll submit yourself to Christ, sir, I promise you, she'll submit herself to you in spiritual issues. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives should be subject to their husbands in everything, respecting both their position as a protector, I hope you're her protector, and their responsibility to God as the head of the house. Man up. Be the head of the house. I can't tell you how many men I talk to, and I say, so how are you doing financially? I don't know, my wife runs all that. How much is your mortgage? I got no idea. How, how much is, was your electric bill last week? I, got no, I just gave her my check. I love her, so I give it to her. Your wife's better at doing the books. Let her do the books, but you better know what's going on. You're the head of the house. You should know what your mortgage payment is. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives. Seek the highest good for her and surround her with a caring, unselfish love, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word of God, so that in turn he might present the church to himself in glorious splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy, set apart for God, and blameless. So watch this. Even so, husbands should and are morally obligated to love their own wives as being, in a sense, their own bodies. Watch how plain and simple this is. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Why? Because we're one. <laughs> it says, for no one ever hated his own body. I don't know about you, but I love me. I love me some me. That's why Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. I hate that verse. I wish it said, love your neighbor like you love your dog. I could do that. <laughs> love your neighbor like you like that guy in church. I could do that. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. Oh, man, I love me some me. Uh, he says uh, his own body, but instead he flourishes and protects and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members, parts of his body. Here's my, I'm closing, watch this. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined and be faithfully devoted to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. There's that companionship. Watch this. This mystery, this mystery of two becoming one is great. I am speaking with reference to the relationship of Christ and the church. The marriage is a symbol of Christ and the church becoming companions and one. 
That's why marriage is so sacred. So listen, in a Christian marriage, three are married. And united loyal, and the united loyalty of the two towards the third, who is God, keeps the two in an active unity with each other as well as with God. When I'm focused on what God wants, I'll be focused on what my wife needs. I'll give you one slide and we'll go home. Watch this. A marriage which, which does not constantly crucify its own selfishness and self-sufficiency, which does not die to itself, that it may point beyond itself, is hardly a Christian marriage. Oh, I'm going to get an email. Marriage, the family, must exist for the glory of God. When we fail to understand marriage as connected to the kingdom of God, as representing Christ and the church, that family has ceased to be for the glory of God. It has ceased to be a sacred entrance into his presence for the world around us to view. The goal of my marriage is to show to the world around me the power of the unity between Christ and the church. And Christ is not in a contract with the church. He's in a covenant with the church. And when I show to the world around me what Christ has done in our marriage, our marriage actually becomes a window into the kingdom of God and his love for mankind. What God does in a marriage is what God wants to do with the whole human race. He says it's the will of God that none should perish. God wants everybody to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And through a marriage, what God is showing the world is that two people who are entirely different, who are on opposite ends of the spectrum, can come together and be made one through the unity that they have with their Heavenly Father. Why? Because the church, although we were estranged from God and we were once aliens and we were once lost, are now the sons and daughters of the living God because Christ is now in our hearts. And so marriage is a sacred symbol to the world. This is why when the world attacks marriage, whether that's through gay marriage or whether that's through divorce or whether that's through just living together, when the church, when the world attacks marriage, this is why you see the church rise up. Not because we don't want anybody else to be married. Not because we want to spoil anybody's fun. Not because we just want to be negative towards people. Not because we don't love people. Oh, you don't love people enough. I love people, but I love God even more. And God says that marriage is a symbol of the unity of Christ and the church. Why do you think the devil attacks marriage so much? Why do you think he wants to destroy it? Because it is a symbol. It is a sacred gateway for people to look into your lives. Listen, your marriage is to be for the glory of God. Stop being so selfish. Well, I, I want to be happy. Shut up. If you're married, you're not always happy. Well, I deserve to... No, you don't. You don't deserve anything. If you get what you deserve, I'll come and bury you tomorrow. If I get what I deserve, you're going to come and bury me tomorrow. If we got what we deserve. God didn't give us what we deserve. He gave us his only son. And we need to stand up for the sacredness of marriage and understand that in our relationship, when you're having an argument the next time, you're having an argument, and I understand it, we, we, we clash. When you have an argument, you need to calm down and say, hold on, hold on, hold on. How can we resolve this that it might bring glory to our Heavenly Father? Amen. How can I fulfill my role? How can you fulfill? Let's do what God wants us to do in this relationship. Let's be God honoring, not flesh honoring. You'll make it, I promise you. It'll be hard. It's hard, it's hard work being married. <laughs> I know what I'm talking I've been married 38 years. It's hard work. Not for me, for my wife, but it's hard work. Your marriage is a symbol of Christ and the church. See it for that, and you'll begin to understand the importance and the sacredness of marriage. Father, would you help us today to make this a reality in our homes and our marriages? God, last week we prayed for every married person in the building, and every married couple stood. God, we're not going to repeat that exercise today, but, but I ask you, God, that you would bless every home every relationship that is in this building today. God, help us to understand that your desire is not to divide. You don't want me to, to be divided from my brother, from my sister, from a, a, a co-worker. You don't, you don't want division. You want unity. So God, help us to apply these rules and principles even to the practical parts of our lives, our relationship with other people. But Father, I pray today that here at New Life, you would help us with renewed passion and renewed vision, understand that the purpose of marriage is companionship, yes. I love having a best friend. 
but it's more than that. It's so that I can show the world the glory of God in a relationship and that I can show his relationship to the church through our marriage. Help us to do this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen, new life.